France, 1916. A terrifying new killing machine appears on the World War I battlefield. The tank. On a mission to crush German defenses and end two years of bloody trench warfare. The advent of tanks changes warfare completely. It, it will never be the same again. The rolling 28-ton monsters horrify the Germans and send panic through the lines. These guys had no idea what's coming towards them. None of these guys had ever seen a machine like a tank. The Germans respond with ferocious firepower. You're sitting in a metal coffin that will turn into an inferno in seconds. And finally, field lethal tanks of their own. Machine gun bullets are smashing against the tank, and that noise is death. The face of modern warfare changes forever, and the stage is set for history's first great tank battle. The tank, undisputed king of the battlefield. Through the 20th century, they had been key to modern mobile warfare, the deciding factor in many of history's greatest battles. The tank's journey began almost a century ago, during the desperate fighting of World War I. In 1916, the Great War is a stalemate. We've got trench warfare. There's a line of trenches with the British and the French on one side, then the Germans on the other. The result, a 700-kilometer network of trenches, barbed wire and machine guns, cutting a deadly swath through Belgium and France. This is the Western Front. The technology of 1916 is based on infantry, which are vulnerable to machine guns, and of course, are always held up by trenches and by barbed wire. So even at the very beginning of the war, people are aware that there must be a way of overcoming barbed wire, trenches, machine guns. The British believe the solution can be found in tracked vehicles. But the idea of a mobile weapon on the battlefield has been around for ages. From Hannibal's war elephants to the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci. And right up to the science fiction ironclads of H.G. Wells. The British launch a top secret weapons program calling it the Tank Project to trick German spies into believing they're water carriers. The reality is lethally different. These are mobile killing machines. What makes the tank so important in the First World War is that for the very first time, you get the combination of thin armor plate, a power source, and the technology of the track. On January 29, 1916, the British unveil history's first tank, the Mark I. Outfitted with two enormous 20-meter-long tracks, the Mark I is designed to span even the widest of trenches and can be armed with either two six-pounder naval guns or four deadly Vickers machine guns. Wheels at the back help keep it stable, but it's slow, cumbersome, and requires a large crew to take it into battle. There would normally be eight men in one of these tanks. Four of them are dealing with the guns. The rest of the crew, the other four men, are all involved in driving. Now, this tank is virtually identical in size to the tanks that first went into action on the Somme in September 1916.
The Battle of the Somme, fought over five months in 1916, was British commander Douglas Haig's attempt to end the two year stalemate. By September, it has already cost the Allies over 300,000 casualties. Desperate to stop the carnage, Haig turns to his new weapon. And the decision was taken, use the tanks as soon as they were available. They'll go into battle north of the Somme River. For his attack, Haig has amassed 200,000 men, more than 700 artillery pieces, and 49 of his brand new tanks. And they're up against more than 100,000 German soldiers dug in an 11-kilometer front. But before Haig can launch his main attack, he must first eliminate a threat to his flank by clearing the Germans from Delville Wood. And for the first time in the history of warfare, tanks will lead the attack. This is uh, Delville Wood. This is the start line of the attack by three tanks of D Company in the first ever tank attack on the morning of the 15th of September, 1916. But when the tanks were here, their crews wouldn't have seen nice, pretty countryside. They would have seen shell holes, splintered trees. It would have been hell on earth. They even called it Devil's Wood. Three tanks from D Company move out into the pre-dawn darkness. The crews trusting their lives to these unproven new weapons. In a matter of moments, one tank breaks down and is unable to continue. Another gets stuck on uneven ground. But one tank, nicknamed Daredevil by its commander, Captain Harold Mortimer, continues the attack. On that morning, the whole thing seemed so unreal. I didn't think my tank would be the first in the world to fire a shot in anger. I saw lots of flashes coming from the edge of the woods. I gave the order to open fire with one of the six-pounders. Managed to get astride one of the trenches, but we got a direct hit. They broke my track. All three tanks are lost, but the infantry take Delville Wood, clearing the way for Haig's main attack, which calls for 200,000 Allied troops to advance along an 11 kilometer front. Their objective the fortified villages of Courcelette, Morval, and Fleur. And for the first time, tanks will lead a mass infantry attack. Their mission, crush the barbed wire and suppress machine gun fire, allowing the infantry to advance and storm the German trenches. This is where the battle begins. Early in the morning of the 15th of September, down this road here come the tanks, moving towards the village. Already assembled are all of 41st Division. The infantry waiting to go forward with their tanks leading. Essentially, everything is heading towards that village. That down there is the objective, the first tank attack. After a massive artillery barrage, the tanks crawl slowly towards German lines in small groups. Inside the tank now, things are really unpleasant. Not only do we have this tremendous amount of noise roaring off the engine, which is right in the middle, these exhaust stacks carrying the fumes out through the top of the tank will now be so hot you won't be able to touch them. In fact, they'll start glowing pink after a while in the dark, and you'll just feel the heat radiating off them onto your skin. Now we're getting closer to the firing line. The ground's getting rougher, the tank's slowing down. Lieutenant Basil Henri's tank approaches no man's land, the point of no return. We got our first look at what looked like impossible ground. Hardly a yard was not a shell crater. It was like a rough sea made of holes. After a hundred yards, George stopped with engine trouble. 
This time, for good. The majority of the tanks actually break down. That they stall, that they run into mechanical problems, things simply break into the tank, and they stop. Down one very steep incline, something happened to Archie's car. He reported that he was out of action and that I was to go on alone. Of the original tank force, only nine remain operational. With them is Lieutenant Arthur Arnold and his tank nicknamed Dracula. The going was now simply one succession of shell craters. It was thrilling the way the tank would go down into a crater, stick her tracks into the opposite wall, and then steadily climb out. So you're in a dimly lit compartment. You've then got the situation where it's bucking up and down. Unless you hold on to things, then actually you're going to fall over and things are moving in there. Gunner Alfred Reifer is in a D Company tank, which crawls closer to the German trenches and spots serious trouble. A German observation balloon. It can quickly call in a deadly artillery attack and halt the advancing tanks and infantry. It must be destroyed immediately. Percy Bolt excitedly told me he was going to fire at a German observation balloon. Several rounds are fired and Bolt claimed a direct hit. A handful of tanks breach no man's land and bear down on the German front line, where hundreds of defenders are shocked to see the approaching metal monsters. In 1916, the Germans had basically no idea that the tank was in development. So they're sitting there and staring out, and then the first thing they realized was the sound. Because tanks are loud. These guys had no idea what's coming towards them. None of these guys had ever seen a machine like a tank. Most of them haven't, haven't even seen a, a car. They started firing too, with machine guns and rifles. The world's first tanks are now almost on top of the German lines and are about to face their biggest battlefield test. By now, machine gun bullets are smashing against the tank. It's like being in a hailstorm in a tin box. And that noise is death. September 15th, 1916. The first tank attack in history is underway. Here at the bloody Battle of the Somme, the British hope the new armored weapons will crush German defenses and help to end two years of trench warfare. Mechanical problems and rough terrain stop most of the tanks in their tracks but some make it across no man's land and grind slowly forward into German fire. By now, machine gun bullets are smashing against the tank. And that noise is death. As we approach, they let fire at us with might and main. Then a smash against my flap caused the splinters to come in and the blood to pour down my face. Dracula reached the line first. A row of German heads appeared above the parapet and looked in some amazement at what was approaching out of the murk of the bombardment. In 1916, the Germans had basically no idea that the tank was in development. These guys had no idea what's coming towards them. None of these guys had ever seen a machine like a tank. One stared and stared and stared, as if one had lost the power of one's limbs. The big monsters approached us slowly, but always advancing. Someone shouted, the devil is coming. They started firing too, with machine guns and rifles. Both didn't do any good. 
Damn, this fire spitting thing crosses over shell holes and is coming steadily and surely towards us. The fear of being overrode. It's a very deep fear everybody has been squashed in the ground. So the German soldiers developed something, it's called in German Panzerangst, um, that's tank fear. Now a hail of machine gun bullets passes over us. Out, out, out! Monsters are coming! We were advancing. The tank was on top of the trench, and there we paused. Whilst the thickest guns raked the enemy to port and start. Then on we went again. One of the remaining tanks approaches its final objective at the center of the German defensive line, the village of Fleur. We came into the village, which was a heap of rubble with a few skeletons of houses still standing. There was hell outside, all right. Bolt spotted a couple of German machine gunners who were firing at us. Four rounds from a six-pounder put them out of action. The village of Fleur has been liberated. A British spotter plane observes tank D-17 moving down the main street. The scene in flares was without precedent. Firing as it went, the tank lurched up the main street, followed by parties of cheering infantry. The news spreads quickly. Back home, the British, eager for any good news from the front, celebrate their new lethal weapon. This is the high water mark in the Battle of Fleur, because it's on this spot that the tank D-17 turns round, stops, the infantry come up, and it becomes the point at which the battle ends. Is it a total success? Well, within four days, Haig, General Haig, ordered a thousand tanks. As far as he's concerned, it's definitely proved a point. Tanks have a role in modern warfare. Seven months later, in April of 1917, Haig sends his lethal armored weapons into action near Arras. His plan, exploit what is considered the weak point in the German line, attacking the small village of monchy le preau with a massive strike of artillery, infantry, and tanks. Dawn, April 11th, 1917. The attack is set to begin at 5 a.m., but it's snowing and bitterly cold. Allied commanders order a two-hour delay, hoping the weather will clear. They notify the artillery and infantry, but nobody thinks to tell the tanks. And promptly at five, three tanks move out, all alone. Without knowing it, these tanks are pioneering a new armored tactic, the surprise attack, unheralded by a warning artillery barrage. With them is driver Jack Harris. It seemed odd to be advancing without the usual artillery barrage, but our orders were clear to advance at 5 a.m. and capture Monchy. Throughout the Great War, artillery is seen as being critical to prepare the way for the attack. It breaks up the enemy defenses, it cuts the wire, it may kill a few Germans. But it also warns them of what's happening. At Monchy in 1917, when there is no warning barrage, then the Germans are caught by surprise because the tanks simply appear on that position. We stared aghast as slowly a tank crept towards us and we opened fire. We hoped a wide ditch at the side of the road would stop it. But it doesn't. And now the tanks have Moshi Le Preau at their mercy. The 
just drove straight down the main street, while the crew fired at everything in sight. Every gun in the tank was firing. I could see lots of Jerry's getting out of the place as fast as they could. The tank crew opened up with a murderous machine gun fire. Those that were not killed instantly screamed as they laser wounded. We got clear through to the other side of the village. When we looked back, we saw that Jerry had tumbled to the fact that we didn't have any infantry with us. And I could see German soldiers popping up out of cellars and dugouts and reoccupying the positions we'd just cleared. The officer said, looks like we've got to capture it all over again. So we did. But this time, they will not have the element of surprise. The tanks were not well armored on the top because the main armor had to be in the front. And if you throw grenades, which the Germans have in abundance, onto the roof, that may well rupture the fuel tank. And the explosion uh, will go in every way, so down also and kill, hopefully, the crew. You know that with the fuel tanks inside the vehicle in which you're sitting, then you're sitting in a metal coffin that will turn into an inferno in seconds. One tank takes a direct hit, and the remaining two keep moving right into a wall of armor-piercing bullets. If you can imagine being inside an armored vehicle when you're hit by armor-piercing ammunition, so it'll zip around the tank, bouncing off things. And if it hits a person, you can work out what that'll do. If it bursts a fuel line or it hits ammunition, then it'll turn it into a funeral pyre in a few seconds. German gunners destroy the second tank and heavily damage the third, driven by Lieutenant Jack Harris. I managed to get the old bus out of that corner. But by that time, we were all wounded. I got a bullet in the side of the neck. A bit of a bloody mess. It came in through the gun mount. Harris has almost made it out of the town and to safety. At 7 a.m., Allied artillery opens up on Morshi Lepu, unaware that their own tanks are already in the town. And things get even worse for Harris and his crew, as a British shell destroys their tank. Only Jack Harris survives. The tank attacks on Morshi Lepu fail, but succeed in teaching the tank commanders the value of tactical surprise. And it will be the element of surprise that the Allies will employ in their coming winter offensive. The Battle of Cambrai in November 1917 is a completely new way of using tanks. Now we're actually using them en masse, over 500 of them. The stage is now set for what will become the first massed armored attack in history. November 1917. British tanks have been on the World War I battlefield in small numbers for more than a year, proving they have a role in modern warfare. Now, Allied commanders raise the stakes drastically. They send not dozens, but hundreds of tanks to the Western Front, all of them manned by history's first specially trained tank corps. The era of the massed tank attack is about to begin.
The motto of the British Tank Corps is through the mud and the blood to the green fields beyond. And that was what had been looked for throughout the Great War, and that was what they hoped to achieve. With the new Tank Corps, the Allies hoped to punch holes through the Hindenburg Line and capture the strategically important city of Cambrai. The Germans have made this part of the line one of the most heavily fortified sectors on the Western Front. There are more than 250,000 troops, dozens of machine gun posts, a maze of barbed wire, and for the first time, specific countermeasures against the tanks. One of the great antidotes to the tank was the German the Hindenburg line with trenches, say, 16 feet wide. And that was done on purpose to defeat the tank's one great ability to cross trenches. Now we're actually using them en masse, over 500 of them. We're now using the Mark IV tanks, which are much, much better. The Mark IVs have thicker armor, making them less vulnerable to machine gun fire. November 20th, 200,000 troops and almost 500 tanks are poised for an all-out strike on the Hindenburg Line. And the first massed tank attack in history begins. Advancing with them is Major William Watson. To right of me and to left of me, in the dim light were tanks. Tanks lined up in front of the wire, tanks swinging into position. There was one tank to every 30 yards of front. When the guns began, the tanks were moving over the crest of the hill. The enemy trenches were already enveloped in thick smoke. The German defenders are taken by surprise. All hell broke loose. I could see the trench lit up by a sea of flame caused by the incessant exploding shells. The sentry suddenly made an extraordinary remark. Herr Leutnant, something four-cornered is coming. Then we saw a whole chain of these steel monsters advancing towards our trenches. I clung onto the hope that the trench would be wide enough to present the tanks with an impassable obstacle. It's also realized that some of the tanks need to be equipped with fascines, or, or very big bundles of brushwood. And these are all put on the nose of the tank. The intention is they can drop them in to the very deep German trenches. The Hindenburg Line has enormously deep trenches. Without them, they'll become bogged. They had a system to go over trenches while one tank was dropping uh, wood in the trenches, covering the second tank, the second tank was going over the trench, and that was like a murderous ballet rolling towards them. So the, the mass attack of the, of the British tanks was very successful. The tanks made rapid progress, crossing the trench to our left and right, maintaining heavy fire against the trench. We were utterly defenseless in the face of these monsters. This was no longer a battle. This was a massacre. The Germans facing the mass attack at Cambrai were facing a new dimension of, of tank attacks, and they had no technical and psychological instruments to cope with it. They were completely overwhelmed on a military and a psychological base. It looks like an overwhelming victory. But the battle for Cambrai is far from over. And the Germans have prepared a lethal surprise for the steadily advancing Allies. November 20th, 1917, the Allies launch history's first mass tank attack. Almost 500 new British Mark IV tanks lead infantry across the first trenches of the Hindenburg Line and advance towards their objective, the French city of Cambrai. It's incredibly successful. The enemy, it would appear, have no way of dealing with this large number of tanks. The tanks have crossed two lines of German defenses and now stand poised to break through the Hindenburg Line. 
Tanks of H Battalion are among waves of armor, moving up the right shoulder of Flesquier Ridge. Tank Harrier, commanded by Gordon Hassel and the others, stop at the summit. Cambrai, the Allied objective, lies in the distance. It seems too good to be true. I said to my driver, Sergeant Callahan, I don't like this somehow. I don't know why. A shell from a German field gun destroys Hong Kong. Harrier and the other tanks try desperately to get out of its range. We're going downhill and we're able to get up a bit of speed. Then I heard a tremendous explosion and saw one of our tracks go flying through the air. But then we got another hit which carried away our roof. Then a third shot crashed through the back and we were out of action. The gun that destroys Harrier also hits Huntsman and Harvester. The Germans have sprung their surprise, unleashing fire from a weapon that quickly becomes their main tank killer, the 77 mm Krupp field gun. Normally used for indirect fire on trenches, the 77 has been modified for direct fire against tanks and its six kilogram armor-piercing shells are accurate at distances of up to a kilometer. Now, the Germans had started by the summer of 1917 to train their gunners in anti-tank work. And the first real evidence we have of this is a location on the Combray battlefield at a village called Flechuyer where a line of British tanks run across the front of a German battery trained in anti-tank fire. And the tanks, with their fuel stored inside, are highly vulnerable to field guns. Petrol, the gasoline, was actually here in the front, 25 gallons of it either side. So the chances are that if a shell came in, the tank would ignite. It would probably then set the ammunition off, the tank would blow up. And nobody would come out of it alive. Tanks suddenly appeared to our front around Flesquiel. I ordered sights to be set at 700 meters. And with our third shot, we knocked out a tank. In short order, we followed this with three more. Then, with my one remaining gun, dealt with four more tanks. It was like a shooting gallery. The, the British tanks were rolling over the hill, not knowing what was coming. He was waiting for them, knowing what was coming. At close quarters, with direct fire, our courageous artillery destroyed all tanks within range. An impressive number of these expensive pieces of fighting equipment were strewn around the battlefield like so much scrap iron. In two days of fighting, the Allies lose 179 tanks, but take Flesquier, clearing the way to their main objective, Cambrai. It's really regarded as a tremendous success. This is a victory. The success of Cambrai, however, is illusory. At the Battle of Cambrai, which is often referred to as the, the first big tank battle, yeah, the tanks made good progress. They, they covered ground up to 30 kilometers. But what's always forgotten, the German stormtroopers took back the same area within a few days and with very few losses. And now the Germans come up with another response to the rolling British armor, a monster tank of their own, 
history's first tank-on-tank -tank battle is about to begin. In World War I, a tank has become the Allies' best bet for crossing German trenches. By 1917, hundreds are in action on the Western Front. But unknown to the Allies, the German High Command has been secretly developing a tank of their own. The misconception many people of our age have is that this was an easy task. Building an armored vehicle in the First World War was an enormous challenge. It's, it's like nuclear technology nowadays. By March 1918, a year and a half after the debut of the British tank, the German Empire sends a 30-ton monster to the front. The A7V is powered by two 100-horsepower gasoline engines. Protected by 15 millimeters of side armor, and armed with a 57 millimeter main gun and six heavy machine guns. The German tank in use in 1918 is a strange beast in many ways. It is, however, very big. It mounts a big field gun right in the nose, and it's got machine guns. Lots of people in there, about 18 to 23 people, so it's pretty crowded in there. But a villa's better known in 1918 it goes into action. April 24th, 1918. The Germans, armed with their new tanks, capture villers Bretonneau and send the tanks south to the nearby village of Cashy. Three British tanks advance, unaware that they're about to make history, led by Lieutenant Frank Mitchell. The order came, proceed to Cashy, hold it at all costs. Suddenly, an infantryman shouted through our flap, look out, Jerry tanks about. I looked out. There, some 300 yards away, a round, squat-looking monster was advancing, and farther away to left and right pulled two more of these armed tortoises. A great thrill ran through us all. So we had met our rivals at last, for the first time in history, Tank was encountering Tank. The most interesting thing about this fight is um, both sides didn't have the slightest idea how to fight a tank-to-tank -tank battle. Both sides were astonished at the side of the other, um, and both sides were improvising. And after a second of astonishment on both sides, the British fired the first shot in the first tank battle of history. We kept on a zigzag course. The right gunner made a sighting shot. Three British and three German tanks bear down on each other over the shell cratered ground. The lead German tank opens fire with its main gun. hitting both female Mark IVs and blowing holes in their sides. Their machine guns are useless against the heavy armor of the A7V. They withdraw, leaving Mitchell's tank to face the A7Vs alone. Two of their Mark tanks fled the battlefield, um, not because um, they were scared, but because they were female tanks, so they just had uh, machine guns. But the male Mark tank, the third Mark tank with a gun, shut it out with the A7V. The right gunner made a sighting shot. The shell burst some distance beyond the leading enemy tank. No reply came. A second shot boomed out, landing just to the right. But again, no reply. Suddenly, against our steel wall, a hurricane of hail pattered and the interior was filled with myriads of sparks and flying splinters. 
My face was stung with minute fragments of steel. The Jerry tank had treated us to a broadside of armor-piercing bullets. The ground was heavily scarred with shell holes. We kept going up and down like a ship in a heavy sea, making accurate shooting difficult. Another raking broadside of armor-piercing bullets gave us our first casualty, the Lewis gunner, after piercing the side of the tank. We turned. I took a risk and stopped the tank for a moment. It's a dangerous move. Mitchell is now a stationary target for the German tanks. April 1918. Three British and three German tanks meet in history's first tank-on-tank -tank battle. After his two companions are forced to retreat, British commander Frank Mitchell stops his Mark IV to give the gunner a better shot at the German A7V. I took a risk and stopped the tank for a moment. The Mark IV is now a stationary target. The pause was justified. And a carefully aimed shot hit the turret of the German tank, bringing it to a standstill. The shot instantly kills a gunner and mortally wounds two others. Another roar, and yet another white puff at the front of the tank denoted a second hit. Then, once more, with great deliberation, he aimed and hit for the third time. We had knocked the monster out. The two remaining A7Vs creep forward. If they both pour concentrated fire on the British tank, it will be obliterated, along with Mitchell and his crew. Now I thought we shall not last very long. We sprinkled one of them with a few sighting shells, when to my intense joy and amazement, I saw it go slowly backwards. Its companion did likewise, and in a few minutes they both had disappeared from sight, leaving our tank the sole possessor of the field. It's all over in minutes. This first chance encounter in the spring of 1918 between the Germans and the Allied armies becomes a defining moment in the history of modern warfare. Seven months later, the Great War finally ends. Although tanks can't be said to win the war, the fact that they're available is very, very important for the Allies. They're part of that mix which allows ultimate victory to be achieved. The advent of tanks changes warfare completely. It, it will never be the same again. Once you've let this out of the box, you can't put it back again. The motto of the British Tank Corps is through the mud and the blood to the green fields beyond. And that was what had been looked for throughout the Great War and that was what they hoped to achieve.